Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast. Of course, we're here to talk about Tottenham Hotspur and the transfer window and the season so far. I'm absolutely delighted to bring it back to the channel, Leanne Sanderson, uh, former England international, 50 caps, 15 goals. Leanne has had a very successful career, winning many trophies and now having an incredible broadcasting career, interviewing so many legends of the game. Uh, Leanne, of course, you've been working on Sky Sports, Talk Sport, The Zone, CBS Sports, Paramount, presenting, being a pundit. I tell you what, you must have an incredible agent. You've been all over the place in the past year or so, had an incredible 2023, which we'll talk about. First of all, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, yeah, it feels like forever ago. I love Christmas. It feels like forever ago. It was Christmas and New Year. But um, yeah, I'm loving, every, loving everything about life right now. I just moved house. So all feeling good. And now I get to go back to America at the end of the month in the nice sunshine. I was going to say that during most of 2023, it just looks like on your Instagram, it looks like you spent most of the time in America. How has that been? Yeah, loved it. I mean, I lived there for 12 years. You know, I played there um, and it's like a place I call home and I've got my green card. So, you know, I love it. And people always say to me, you're always in the sun. I'm like, I know I love the weather. But then I also I'm always, you know, work hard, play hard. So I just blessed that I get to work in some amazing places. And it happens to be, you know, Miami. So that helps a little bit. It's nice and hot. And for me, it's never too hot. And I get to um, interview some incredible people. I've got to interview Megan Rapino in her last game. She's a friend of mine, a former teammate as well. So, you know, it's just sometimes I just have to pinch myself. But I think, you know, work hard, hard work always pays off. And if you surround yourself with the right people as well, um, I think you can go far. Leanne, on your Instagram, you're either in some exotic place, having an amazing background, or you're with a celebrity or a very famous person. Uh, some of the pictures I've seen recently, you you interviewing Harry Kane, the likes of Wayne Rooney as well, Jamie Carragher, Oli Murs. How were those interviews? Yeah, it was great. I mean, it does help when I have a rapport with the players already, because they know, you know, as much as I'm in broadcasting, I'm not a journalist. I love journalists, but I'm not trying to get a story. You know, so it's almost like we just have a bit of a laugh and and that type of stuff. So, yeah, I loved it. And Harry Kane um, signed a, uh, his shirt for my um, father-in-law. So that was really nice. And he loves Tottenham. I think I told you this before. He's been, you know, he's he's uh, been going down the lane since he was a boy. He knows every single Tottenham player from back in the day. So you'll never see him without a Tottenham shirt on. So the fact that he's got that shirt up and then in the same week, he signed for Bayern Munich. <laughs> So I was like, but he still loves him. Bobby's always saying, that's my father-in-law, he's always saying, oh, he'll come back one day. So that takes pride of place in the house. But um, yeah, like all the guys, Jamie Carragher, Wayne Rooney, you know, with me, because I get on well with them. They know I'm not trying to get stories. So it's a bit more of a laugh and all that. So, and they've been supporting some amazing things like the Women's Football Awards. Harry Kane turned out for that, Declan Rice, all the guys in that. So it's nice to have all their support. Yeah, and of course, you've been all over the place. But yesterday, you are in the same place as me, Old Trafford, Manchester United 2, Spurs 2. What did you make of the game? Do you know what? Like, I would have taken it before the game. But then when we went ahead twice, I was thinking, you know, I said to um, my partner and her dad, I said, you know, I think I think it'd be a draw today. But then I also thought we were going to win because I'm optimistic. And then when I was there in the stretch for them, I was thinking, ah. Oh. And to be honest, like, I think we were quite lucky that you didn't have Son, Basuma, you know, Saar, um, to name a few. Obviously, Kudasevsky was ill as well. And I think there was an illness running through the team. Didn't 12 of them get sick in the week or something? But, yeah. um, but just, to be fair, it's good to see Richarlson scoring. I just wish it wasn't against us because um, I like him and I like everything. You know, I like his celebration he did at the World Cup and that type of stuff. But um, I think footballing-wise, you completely outplayed us. I was really surprised before the game because my mate I actually took him. He's a Tottenham fan. He sat with me in the Man United end. Um, which is hard to do if you've ever done it and you support the other team, it is hard. Like, I did it for years oh, yeah. in the Arsenal end, and you know, I used to grab my mum's leg when we scored, and you know, it was hard. So, um, but I think when I saw the midfield that you guys had out, you know, Oli Skip, Hoiberg, I like Benton Core a lot because he was at Juventus when I was there. I thought, you know, you look at our midfield, I was thinking we'll have to run into this midfield, and then you guys went through us like a knife through butter, especially for Benton Core's goal, you know. So, I think we left ourselves wide open. And then Man United frustrate me because there's spells where we look really good. And then just the basics of, you know, passing from A to B, it's just so weird. Um, but the fans were fully behind them. So, I mean, in the Stratford end, it's pretty loud. I think everywhere else, it's always so quiet at Old Trafford. And that's why I like going to the away games more. Because you get those diehard, you know, fans that are a bit like me. 
Um, so, yeah, I'll take the point. But the fact we went ahead twice and you guys looked like you were going to score on uh, every single set piece. I mean, I think you probably had about 15 corners or something like that. And it was just every single time you got a corner, big credit to uh, Pedro Poro because I was um, really critical of him last season, especially against Bournemouth. He was at fault for your three goals. And I was at yeah. that game. And I thought he was poor, but he looks brilliant now. Like his delivery, his positioning. Garnacho couldn't get, you know, Garnacho and the, our white players didn't get a sniff yesterday at all. Yeah, and have you been surprised with what you've seen from Tottenham this season? Because, of course, the last time you were on, a lot has changed uh, <laughs> since then, since we last spoke. Uh, Postacoglu, of course, coming in the summer. We did some fantastic business in the summer. Um, you know, got signings in early. We've done exactly the same in this January transfer window. But have you been surprised with what you've seen at Spurs in the last six months and where Spurs are right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last time I was on with you, it was when I was saying about Antonio Conte needs to go, you know. So it was just a completely different... I mean, I'm sure the Spurs fans are all feeling the same with regards to how quickly Ange Postacoglu has installed his game plan. And a lot of people said yesterday, you're watching the game, even though there was players missing, the game plan was still there. The thought process was there. You could see what they were trying to do. Even when they brought in, you know, Emerson Royale came on. Yeah, he only came on for a few minutes, but the roles and responsibilities are quite clear for Man mm. Postacoglu. And I think you can see that. Oli Skip, you know, when he went out on loan to Norwich, he looked like his Spurs career was done. A bit like Harry Winks. And I know a lot of Spurs fans probably feel like he's quite fortunate to be there. And I don't disagree with that. But he played well yesterday, Oli Skip. Yeah. And I think what Ange Postacoglu's done in a short space of time, yes, you had a few bumps in the road, you know, losing to City, those types of things. But they're top teams you're losing to. Do you know what I mean? Like Villa and those types of teams. But I've been impressed with what Tottenham are doing this season. And I think the fact that Harry Kane left and no one's even spoken about it, you know, arguably the best centre forward in the world. I think that just about speaks volume to what Ange Postacoglu has done with this team. Um, I like Ben Tonkor. I like that he's cut back from injury. I don't like what Matty Cash did. I'm not saying he did it on purpose, but you know as a footballer like, exactly what you're doing in certain moments. And I'm not saying he set out to hurt him. But it wasn't nice at all. So the fact that he came out from that injury, the ACL, and then got injured again so quickly. Um, but I like what Tottenham are doing. And, you know, I don't have that strong hatred towards Spurs. The way I do about, you know, not hatred, you know, Liverpool or like City or something like that. It's different. With Tottenham, I love I love a lot of their players. You know, Son, I absolutely love Son. And Van der Ven, I mean, he was absolutely brilliant. Vicaria, you know, you've got your shirts behind you. And I'm not saying because of that, but like, the great signings, great signings. I mean, Vicario was about 17 mil or something when he, like, what's crazy? That? Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, you look at Onana, you look at Vicario, it's like night and day, you know. And Van der Ven yesterday, I thought was absolutely brilliant because he didn't really go to come back from injury, you know. Again, we couldn't get anywhere near them. Hoyland was trying to make movements and couldn't get get any, get the rubber of the green with Van der Ven. Yeah, and you mentioned there 17 million pounds for Vicario. A lot of people, a lot of Spurs fans in the summer doubted the appointment of Ange. Of course, that has, uh, you know, that's been laughed at now. They doubted the signing of Vicario. A lot of people said that we've gone for the cheap option rather than David Raya, who a lot of people wanted um, in the summer. Of course, he's gone off to Arsenal. Um, what's been different for you um, in terms of Tottenham, the way that they're doing business, the recruitment and, and everything behind the scenes? I think there's more stability, it seems. And I think no one ever imagined that losing Harry Kane I'm not saying it's a blessing because he's my favorite, one of my favourite players in the world, but sometimes other players have to step up. Son was poor last season by his standards. And all Spurs fans feel the same. I know they love him, but he didn't have a good year last year. You know, the hat trick he scored against Leicester was probably the only thing he did that was really productive. Um, I think, ultimately, fans are always going to have an opinion. And sometimes you might think a player's going to be really, really good and they're poor. You know, look at when we got Bartes for Manchester United. Everyone was talking about a World Cup winner, Veron when they came. So there's players that come with like this mad, you know, credibility price tags and they don't always work out. Whereas, you know, you look at the recruitment that Tottenham have done and Ange Postacoglu, the players he's brought in, I understand why the fans would be thinking, who is this goalkeeper? Who is Van der Ven? Why are we not getting X, Y and Z? You know, David Raya was there, but look at what's happened in the end. And I think you've got two top players there that he's signed that I just mentioned, as well as, you know, Eric Dyer. I know he's been a good servant to the club. But I think, you know, you have to get rid of those types of players. I still think players like Emerson Royale shouldn't be anywhere near the Spurs squad. You know, yes, he's not starting many games, but the standard that I think Tottenham should be going towards, those types of players can't be in there, Eric Dyer. You know, he obviously got something about him because all the managers play him. 
You know, they want him around. Apart from Ange Postacoglu, everyone else, he's been one of the first names down on the team sheet. He was never, like, completely dismissed from the squad. So, with Ange Postacoglu, I say this, managing is an art, and I say this all the time. It's not easy to go into management. Players go into management. Gerard, Lampard, it's not easy. Ange Postacoglu, in every press conference, interviews, he has that respect. He has that authority. You believe what he's saying. And he's honest and fair. And I think that's all you ask for. When you when you look back at the Premier League era since it started in 92, have you ever known something like this happen so quickly where the fans are on board so quickly with a manager like they are with Postacoglu and, and, and how he's transformed the football club so quickly? Well, I mean, you've only got to look at similar, not this similar, and I hate to draw comparisons to Arsenal. When Arthur Wenger went to Arsenal, people were thinking, who is this? You know, and he's making signings for half a million of Henri, Patrick Vieira, all those signings were minimal money. And everyone's thinking, who are these players? And look what he did. So I think it'd be, it's, it's a bit of a bold statement to say, you know, he's done the most amazing job in a short space of time. Because you look at what Gary O'Neill did last year as well with Bournemouth. There's teams that do do good things. But yeah, I and I'm not getting carried away yet. I'm not no. getting carried away yet. No, but I will. I, I think he's, I love Ange Postecoglou. I could speak about him all day. I love everything about him. But I do think where you're at now, in comparison to where you were a year ago, and when we, not even a year ago, we I was on here with you, Chris, it's night and day. And all yeah. you want to see from your players, any fan, is you fight for the shirt. The shirt. You you know, you might not have your best game, but you put yourself about and you see that fight and hunger. And I think Ange Postecoglou demands that. I think Antonio Conte demands standards, but sometimes the way you communicate and go about it is the wrong way. When I was yeah. at Juventus, the players said the same thing. You know, Antonio Conte, nice guy, but just does too much. The players were absolutely shattered. You know, no days off, all those types of things. And people say, oh, you know, professional footballers, what do they need days off for? You do. You need a break. Mentally, psychologically, it don't matter how much money you're getting paid. We're all from the same place. Do you know what I mean? So you do need a break. So I think Ange Postacoglu is fair. And I still think he could even bring in even better players, if I'm being honest. You know, you look at your midfield yesterday. I'm sure... What did you think about the midfield before the game? I'm sure you were thinking, don't know about this. Do you know what? It was, uh, we've got so many players out. And I think that um, that is the difference in quality between Man United and Spurs at the moment. I think that if we'd have had our, our full uh, strength 11 out, and I, and I felt like this all season because Postacoglu's had so many injuries, suspensions and other issues on and off the pitch. And I think that if we'd have had our full strength 11 out every single game, we'd be sitting top of the Premier League. Um, some people might see that as a bit deluded, but I don't think so. Um, I think that he's done an amazing job. And when you look at our starting eleven, and this is what the, the next question I wanted to ask you, actually. He said last week that Spurs are in the title race. Do you believe so? Yes. Um, I think based upon City being so inconsistent this year, I think City's win against Newcastle was massive. I still think it's hard for me to see anywhere but City. I know people are saying Liverpool. But I think with regards to what Pep does, they're just too good. But I think they are in it. If you're going to say, you know, the likes of Arsenal are still in it, Liverpool are 100% in it. But yeah, why not? I mean, you know, what you've done this year to Man United taken four points off of us, I don't consider us a... We're like a mid-table team at the moment. Let's be honest. We're like, you know, I said to my dad yesterday, it's like we are Manchester... Well, they're wearing a Man United shirt, but they might as well be like, you know, Bournemouth or Crystal Palace type of players. And that's no disrespect to those clubs. Because there's players at Palace and Bournemouth that I'd rather have than have some mm. of the players I have at United. So I still think it's still a building process with, and you know what football is like, Chris. You don't want to get too carried away because I did under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. You know, he, yeah. he came in, did amazingly well, and then look what happened. We appointed him and we were terrible. So, you know, I think they're building, and that's all you want to see from a fan's perspective. I still don't think Tottenham will win the league. I'm really, really gutted for you that you got City in the FA Cup because I was watching the draw. Um, with my partner, a massive Tottenham fan, and her dad is, and I went, you're going to get City, and I was kind of joking. And then I was like, oh, my God, and she was fuming. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you think of that draw? Because um, I'm going to pull some stats out now. They've, they've come to our new stadium five times. They've lost all five games, and they haven't scored a goal. Of course, Pep desperately wants to win at Spurs. He desperately wants the, the, the team to score, obviously. Um, how do you see that game going? It's, well, the stats speak for themselves. And I think when you guys go to the Etihad as well, you always seem to get, you know, last year when Harry Kane banged in that hat trick. I think Spurs can win it, but you don't want to be getting City fourth round. We Man United have got Eastley. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, you don't want to be pulling out, you know, Tottenham City in that type of rounding. But 
They can do it, but you'd rather not, let's be honest. I know I'd rather not play City in the fourth round of the FA Cup. Uh, who, who do you think will win? Tottenham. <laughs> only because only because I want my um Only because you're on here. <laughs> no, no, no. I want I want my father in law to be able to go to Wembley this year and see Tottenham. I'd love for them to play in the final. Preferably yeah, we haven't won. <laughs> we haven't won an FA Cup since 1991, which is an absolutely crazy stat. Haven't won a trophy since 2008. Now, do you think that this could be Tottenham's year? And if I was to ask you another question, what do you think is more important to Ange Postacoglu, top four or the FA Cup? And what's more important to the club? See, I think I got asked this question before and I said a, a trophy this year for the fans is what they want. You know, it's exactly what they want. I think Ange Postacoglu messed up in the League Cup based upon his team selection. I don't think he realised just exactly how much the Spurs fans want a trophy. Every club's different. We can say, oh, yeah, Man United want a trophy. No, no. the Tottenham fans desperately want a trophy, right? So yeah. I think Ange Postacoglu, him making the top four, like he thinks they can do both, 100%. He's that type of manager. But I think for him, top four would be the priority. But I think for the fans, I think a trophy. That's just my personal opinion. Knowing a lot of Tottenham fans, knowing, you know, a lot of my friends are Spurs fans as well. They want a trophy. So, I don't know. I think you could do both with the way you're going, but it's not going to be easy. No, absolutely right. What have you made of Tottenham's business in the January transfer window so far? Of course, Timo Werner made his debut at Old Trafford yesterday, got an assist. Uh, Radu Dragusin came on as a sub, made his debut yesterday at Old Trafford. What have you made of Spurs' business? I'm not really a fan of Timo Werner. I'm not going to lie. I, I said it to my mate, who's the first fan that was sitting with me yesterday. I said, like, you know, when he was at Chelsea, he doesn't know how to hold his hold um, hold his run. He's always offside. But then, having said that, Rashford and Hoyland yesterday were so lazy when they were just offside and dropping in. I like Timo Werner. He seems like a really nice guy. I love him in an interview. You know, you want to give him a hug, but he's not. He's not for me. When he was linked to Manchester United, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So what was interesting, Chris, when he was linked to Man United, everyone was going, oh, my God, can't believe it, Man United. Then he's gone to Tottenham and everyone's saying, oh, this is good. So, you know, especially the fact that he was at Chelsea. I mean, yesterday he had that one chance. Um, is, is, is it not the difference of what Ten Hag could get out of him and what Postacoglu will get out of him? Yeah, I think you're right in saying that. But I still think Timo Werner's levels are, you know, this could come back to bite me. I don't know. But, you know, I'm never going to sit on the fence. I don't think his levels are where Tottenham need to be going. But I also think Brennan Johnson needs to get a better end product as well. I like Brennan Johnson. You can see he's got a lot about him. He's got the pace. He's got the physicality. You know, he seems mm. like a nice person to have around the dressing room. But the end product needs to be better. He was getting service yesterday. Three or four of them were just going straight over. You know, no no end product. So, you know, I think with regards to Timo Werner, I don't really understand that one. Maybe, you know, it would be good to have... A, I don't think he's coming as his backup, to be honest. But I'd as sooner have Skulasevsky, you know, I think even at this moment in time, I'd have Brennan Johnson in those wide areas over Timo Werner. Yeah, and very important that Tottenham got the business done and, and a player, of course, Ange Postacoglu wanted, uh, Dragusin from Genoa. Um, do you expect uh, Spurs to do any more business uh, until the end of the window? And, and if so, what do we need? Yeah, he's absolutely massive, isn't he? When he came into the game yesterday, I was going to say to my mate, I said, he's, what is he, like six foot five or something? He's absolutely like, what a unit. I wouldn't want him running at me. Um, but I don't know, really. I mean, when you look at what Tottenham have got right now, everyone was saying, oh, you know, they need another centre forward, which I, I didn't think Richardson was the answer. But now he's got his like, six in six. Um, and I like Richardson. I always want him to do well because I think when he plays with a smile on his face, when he took that break, you know, when he said, Need a bit of a mental break. I think it almost helped him expressing how he was feeling because he seems to have gone on a bit of a good run now. I still think Spurs can strengthen, especially in that midfield area. But obviously, when Basuma and Sar, I love Basuma. You know, if he doesn't go in recklessly and get red cards and picks up injuries, I like him a lot. And I think Sar as well. But I still think you need to strengthen in the midfield area. Um, I like Benton Core when he's injury free. So again, like you said at the beginning, I don't know about you winning the league if everyone was fit. I don't know if I agree with that. But I get where you're coming from because... I didn't say winning it. I said we'd be top right now. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Um, but I think if he had everybody available at all times, it would have been interesting. Like maybe next season, you'll make more of a push and a go of it. But right now, the only teams I can see, you know, is City and Liverpool. 
uh, going into next season, do you think that um, Rashalison? Do you think Postecoglou will stick with Rashalison? Do you think he has enough faith in him uh, to to be our, our our number nine for next year? Well, you've only got to see what he's been able to do to Richarlison in a short space of time. I'm not saying it's all because of Ange Postecoglou, but you know he's kept playing him, hasn't he? When even when he's not been playing that well, I think at Everton when Richarlison was there, he worked his socks off. You know he's always going to work hard. But the thing is with Richardson, he was doing things where the ball wasn't sticking to him. He wasn't bringing other players in. And ultimately, you're going to be um, judged on how many goals you score. So I think for now, he'll stick with him now that he's doing well. I still think Tottenham could go out and get a world-class centre forward. I really do. It's Tottenham. They're a big club. You've got great stuff going on at the training ground. The stadium is the best in the world for me, apart from when I went to Qatar at Sale. I think those two are probably my favourite stadiums in the world. Um but I think Ange Postecoglou's done an amazing job. Um, I just think you do need to strengthen. If you're going to make the top four and you go into the Champions League, for example, you need more depth, more strength in depth because you've only got to look at Newcastle. You know, I said, I don't think they'd make the top four this year because playing on a Wednesday in the weekend, Wednesday, Saturday or whatever, mm. was going to be too much. I said this at the beginning of the year and it was. They didn't do too bad in Champions League, but they just, they don't have the squad depth to be able to do that. And when they picked up injuries, it was always going to be difficult. But... I think my definition of a top manager is gets the best out of the players individually. And I think Ange Postecoglou seems to be doing that. If you look at all the players individually, last year you could sit here and say, this player's underperforming, this player's underperforming. You could write a list. Now, I'm looking at Tottenham and I'm thinking, which player's been poor this year? The Doogie, I'm unbelievable. Unbelievable. Best ball back in the league this year, one of them. You know what I mean? So yeah. the players that you guys have got in that no one had even thought of, Look how he's maximising them. There's certainly a change and everyone's got a smile on their face right now. Um, players like Brian Hill, Hoybier, Regulon, Lo Celso, Cessignon, would you expect them to move on? I like Lo Celso, you know. I actually do like Lo Celso. But I think there's still a bit of dead wood at Tottenham, a bit like Man United, where there's players that they're still there. Cessignon's always been a weird one to me, similar to Jed Spence, where... They've got players in and they never really seem to be given a chance. As They're injured as all the time. Yeah, and Cessignon as well, like positionally, I feel like he's changed positions about four times. One minute he's, you know, when he was, before he was at Spurs, he was playing more of an attacking money player. Then they played him at fullback. So I think that those types of players, similar to Harry Winks, when you moved him on pretty quickly, you know, um, I think you do need to move those types of players on. But Hoiberg yesterday, to me, and I said it to my mate, like, him and Ericsson, both their, both of them look like their legs are done. Like, I'd have Ericsson in a five-a-side all day long, similar to one matter. But the game's by passing Ericsson now. You know, he's offering mm. nothing in Man United's midfield. He isn't. And I love the guy, but he's offering nothing. When I see Hoiberg yesterday, there was a couple of times, his legs, you must have seen it. Like, And it wasn't because he was tired, because Van der Ven was cramping. That's different. Hoiberg looked like he just didn't have, like, the legs. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, the game was kind of getting ahead, couldn't get near players. But one thing he's always going to do is compete. One, that, well, he, one thing he always he was He was linked with Man United at the start of the season. So, imagine that for a midfield. Hoybier and Eriksson for you. I know, I know. It doesn't surprise me, though. I mean, <laughs> the fact that we had Regulon on loan and we sent him back to you is just a weird one. Like, very, yeah. very strange. But the fact that we've not even touched upon Madison, I know he's been injured, if he was playing yesterday, him and Son, I would have been absolutely like yeah. so worried, so worried beforehand because Madison, what a signing! And I wanted Madison at Man United. Never says yeah, I want Man United. <laughs> no, yeah. how could someone say right? When I said about James Madison when I was on Talksport coming to United, they're saying he's not a Man United type of player. What were people talking about? What can actually perform and also get in the in the hole and turn and do things and make things happen like? Honestly, I don't know why Man United wouldn't be going for players like that. But instead, we're pretty happy to spend, you know, 70 million on Hoyland, Anthony, 80 million, Sancho, 80 million. Like, players that have not really proven in the Premier League. You know what I mean? Like, we're happy to do that. But Madison's shown that he can play consistently in the Premier League and we're not trying to get him. It, it does prove, Leanne, though, doesn't it, that, that you, you've mentioned some of the Man United players there. You know, when you go out and spend big money, it don't necessarily work about how much money you're spending. It's about identifying the right players and the recruitment being really good. And I think that that has really changed at Spurs. 
One of the things I wanted to ask you about as, uh, you know, being a, a former professional, the amount of hamstring injuries that Spurs have had this season. What do you put that down to? Because many people say that the intense training sessions um, at the training ground under Postacoglu, this could have something to do with it. Do you agree with that? You know what? I'm not a doctor, but I remember there was a period of time in like the early 2000s where Arsenal were getting all these muscle injuries and it was because they had been have, using like creatine for body recovery. And I remember I was at the club during that time and then they kind of adapted it because they saw these injuries. I mean, in the women's game, ACL and meniscus is like the number one injury you can get. Personally, I think, you know, with the men and the fast twitch fibres and those types of things, it is a common injury in the men's game anyway. Not in the women's game, not really. Not really many of us pull our hamstrings. But at the end of the day, similar to when Liverpool won the league, you know, when Jurgen Klopp just apparently, from what I heard, was running him into the ground every day. Training was like they were playing in a match every single day. But then they won the league. So it's almost like sink or swim. I think Ange Postacoglu seems fair. But at the end of the day, the intensity in training, I'm sure he seems the type of manager that will listen to the players as well. You know, if and injuries will happen. Look at Newcastle. I remember Leicester last year before they got relegated. All their team was injured. You know, there's Man United have had loads of injuries this year. So maybe they need to take a look at the league on its entirety, you know. But I'm looking forward to seeing Ange Postacoglu, you know, next season. I mean, everybody fit. It'll be interesting to see what he does with that squad. Do you think Spurs will win a trophy soon? I think they will. Um, I hope so for the Spurs fans because I know a lot of Spurs fans. But, you know, it's not going to be easy. They just need to find that consistency. Do you know one thing that always sticks in my mind was the FA Cup last year when um, Antonio Conte put Harry Kane on the bench against Sheffield United in the FA Cup? And I just thought, why would you do that? Like, I've never understood when managers do this, where, OK, you need to manage their minutes. I don't personally get that because I wanted to play in every minute of every game. I'm sure every player does. I understand the intensity. But start the players and then bring them off. Win the game. Let Harry Kane bang in a couple of goals. And then take him off. Yeah. But no, you know, they're, they're, he's benching him. Then you lose the game and then you're at the FA Cup. So it's like, really? Is that really? They've all done it. it. Pochettino did it. Jose Mourinho did it. Antonio Conte did it. I, it, it very, very strange. But uh, the great thing uh, for me is that against Burnley, uh, and put out the best possible eleven, And that is exactly what we've got to do against Manchester City to get have any chance of, of course, going through. Um, Leanne, last question for you. Um, who do you think will win the Premier League and uh, who will finish top four um, and relegation? Oh, so I think City will win the league. I still think they'll win the league. I think Liverpool will come second. I think Arsenal third. I think Tottenham will make the top four. Arsenal third? Yeah. I think Arsenal will finish ahead of you. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> That's OK. It's only a prediction. Um, hopefully that, yeah. that is not going to be the case. But um, it seems that, you know, Arsenal, again, is, are, are going to bottle it this year, yeah? The title. You know what? I think the consistency recently, I think we expected we expected to go all the way to the wire, but I think Arsenal have already fallen off the, the wagon already. You know, was it one win in seven? You know, it's not good enough. And I think we saw Arsenal do that at the end of last season against Southampton at the Emirates when Ramsdale made that mistake. Then against West Ham when they were 2 0 up and then they Saka missed that penalty. So I do love Arsenal. I do have a loyalty to them. I was at the club for 12 years, you know, and, and they, they're good to me. But I just think, you know, right now I can only see Liverpool and, and City being in that, you know, really that elite level of consistency. Because now Kevin De Bruyne is back, it's game over. Do you know what I mean? Like, the end of yeah. for me, like, I could watch him all day. Don't matter what team you support, we have to respect the quality of the players. Yeah. Um, I think for relegation, it's an interesting one because if Everton hadn't got docked 10 points and it was another type of season, I think they'd have already been down and out. The last two years, Everton have been poor. But I think Burnley, 100%. I think Sheffield United. I like what Chris Wilder's trying to do since he's come in there. And I think I'm, I'm debating whether I think it's going to be Luton or Nottingham Forest. But I think because Forest have picked up a decent result of late, I think I'm still going to go with Luton. I don't know whether you saw, Leanne, just before we went live, um, there has been uh, some Premier League statements coming out stating that uh, Everton and Nottingham Forest could be docked points for breaching financial rules. So that's going to be an interesting one. And it seems that 
you know, with financial fair play, not a lot is going on in this January transfer window for clubs because, of course, they're very worried about spending money because they want to spend money in in, in the summer. Um, Leanne, thank you so much for coming back on. Uh, been a, a pleasure talking to you. I love talking uh, to you about football. could talk to you all day. Um, what's next for you? Yeah, I'm going back to America at the end of the month. Thanks for having me on, Chris, first and foremost. And I love coming on your show. Love the questions you ask me because they're not like everyone else. You know what I mean? Like asking me the same questions. Um, next for me, I've got my show on TalkSport on Thursday. And then I'm going to be presenting the new women's football show for the season on TalkSport as well. So that starts next Monday. And then I'll go back to America at the end of the month. So, yeah, busy, busy, busy. But love it. You know, can't complain. Um, apart from the jet lag, that's the only thing. <laughs> that um, I'm a bit like a walking zombie sometimes. But, um, yeah, wish you luck for the rest of the season. And I'm sure my father-in-law will be excited to see this. He loves Tottenham. Leanne, thank you so much. Look forward to having you on again very, very soon. And uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. And until the next time, come on, you Spurs. <laughs>